Good evening. My name is Leslie Wingo, and I am the president and CEO of Sanders Wingo. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Last January, I had the most amazing opportunity of meeting my friend and colleague, Mark Updegrove, with his passion, uh, with my passion, excuse me, for equity, inclusion, and diversity, and Mark's incredible leadership of the LBJ Foundation, we began to engage in conversations about race, history, and how we could encourage others to be in action to create positive change within all of our communities. This change he and I both envisioned moved beyond tough conversations and would give each of us practical solutions in this historic moment of racial justice. Over the last 12 months, with the help and feedback of so many people and organizations in Austin and the surrounding areas, we are honored to have you with us tonight for the third of six virtual conversations on creating a path to racial equity. I would be remiss if I didn't thank the teams at both the LBJ Foundation, Sanders Wingo, our partners, and of course, each of you for engaging in this critical dialogue and making Central Texas a more equitable place for each of us. I wanted to share one other thing, a very exciting opportunity. You are each invited to continue this conversation with the Central Texas Collective for Racial Equity as they will host the Path to, Path to Equity, the after show, every Tuesday at six o'clock on Facebook Live and that's six o'clock p.m. You can sign up and find more information on Eventbrite. So we are about to get started. And as we move through our conversation and discussions this evening, I invite you to drop questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Now, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce two amazing leaders right here in Central Texas. Kelly Mason, Notley partner and founder of Ripple Reads, will help us understand and attract diverse talent amplify their voices and activate for and stand up for people of color and our moderator and my friend, media commentator and CEO of Clifton Consulting, Marjorie Clifton. Welcome. Hi, Thank you, me. Leslie. Okay, this is such a gift because I've got Kelly who has also become a friend and someone that I love talking about these issues with. And so it's, it's, it's such a gift to be able to have this time and space with her. And Kelly is a trailblazer on so many fronts. So we are very fortunate to have you here helping lead this conversation. Things you need to know about Kelly, uh, she's got brains beyond, uh, beyond and beyond. She's a Rice grad, cum laude, and then also uh, Stanford Law School. And then starting in Stanford, she started already her work with building a better legal profession, which was a nonprofit focusing on diversifying law firms and dealing with racial equity and, and did a lot of pro bono work in that capacity. Then went on to co-found Paradigm, which was a data-driven consultancy focusing with startups, technology startups and Fortune 500 companies. And all of that was also to create more inclusive workplaces. So Kelly has been living this work her entire career. And so I wanted to quick off the, kick off the conversation. First of all, I wanna say, because I live in spaces where I am talking about diversity and inclusion, where I'm having conversation with friends and colleagues about race, and this can be hard, it can be tricky. And I think one of the things that makes it tricky is a fear that a lot of people have, and I think especially white people have, about having the conversation the right way, about saying the wrong thing. And so I wanna make an invitation that as Kelly and I have this conversation, and as you send your questions in, to not be afraid to ask what is on your mind. And we know that everyone who hopefully has come to this conversation is coming with the intent to understand, to do better, to do more, and to be part of a dialogue. And so there's, in this space, not a wrong way to ask. So feel free to please send things on and we're gonna talk about them as we go. And for those of you who know me, I dive right in and I don't dance around things. So we're just gonna, we're gonna do that. I and so that. I guess in starting the, the conversation, Kelly, share with us where, what moment, what was, what is your why? What, what, was it a moment in your work? Was it a moment in terms of your growing up or how you were experiencing the world drove you to focus on racial equity in particular in your career and in this work that you do now? Yeah, for sure. Um, so you mentioned, right, I went to law school. Uh, I practiced law for a few years and I vividly recall having summer associate classes and first year and even second year associate classes that had gender parity, right? We had equal amounts of women and men in our summer associate classes and even had really solid racial and ethnic parity and representation. Um, and it seemed promising, but 
it was very clear, you know, after your first luncheon with your summer associate class that the rest of the law firm did not reflect that and particularly the partnerships. So as a woman of color, I thought, you know, and, and as someone who's aspiring at that time to succeed and become a partner at a law firm and um, take that path, I thought, what's going on here, right? Why are women and people of color leaving or being pushed out of the legal profession? Um, and just really got passionate about that problem um, and have followed that problem and pursued that problem uh, throughout my career. So I'm going to dive in on one thing that you mentioned because you talked about gender and racial equity. And I think one of the things I've seen companies fall into is, and a lot of companies have their DEI office, right? Their, Their area where they deal with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Why do we single out race? And, and what, it, what is the reason for doing that? How do we do that as companies? Yeah, well, you know, I think it goes back to, we've seen in this space a lot more progress on the gender side. And then with that, it's white women in particular. And I think from my experience and talking to different CEOs and founders and people in these decision-making uh, roles, and you hear it in interviews when you've got white men who are in positions of power and they talk about what, you know, brought them to Jesus, right? Brought them to value diversity and inclusion. And a lot of times it's a personal story. It's saying, you know, I saw my daughters struggling. Um, I saw, you know, I wanted to mentor people like my daughters Um, or, you know, my sister is just as smart as me and did not, you know, was not able to raise as much money for her startup as I was able to raise for mine. Or my wife is just, is more smarter than I am. And yet I've seen her struggle to progress in her career the same way I've been able to progress. So you've got white men who have this personal connection to women. And so it's just easier to take that next step um, and, to, and to focus on gender because it's easier, right? It's, it's, on the other hand, you've got people who don't even, you know, is it black? Can I say the word black, right? They get uncomfortable around race. And so I think in this work, it is important to say, we're not just going to take the easy approach and get the gold star and um, promote women. And that's important, but we've got to be honest and say, there's some intersectionality here. There is um, a whole group of people who are being left out of inclusion programs that just focus on gender. Well, and you you touched on two things. So, which is how do we create inclusivity, um, you know, at large? So how do we make women, how do we make people of color? And then we isolate this conversation specifically about race, because that's a very different experience than being a white female. Yet, interestingly, like historically, we see a lot of the women's movement and the civil rights movement working in tandem because there is that experience of otherness. And I think there is, as you highlight, sort of how do you create that connection point? So when I think about how you convince companies to do this work, because it's hard work, Um, you know, there's a lot of metrics. So right now, about 63% of the population in the U.S. is Caucasian. But when you look ahead even to 2025, the statistics show that 37% of our entire population will be made up of minorities who are at working age. So that's a huge part of our workforce. And then in 2025, millennials will be 75% of the working population. And of millennials, 56% are white. So you have a much a faster growing um, racially diverse, ethnically diverse population. Why are companies yet still reticent to dive into this work when it is their workforce? What do you see as some of the biggest barriers that we're facing? Yeah, well, and I'll also call out, it's not just their workforce, it's also their consumer base, Thank you. right? Yeah. So you've got this consumer base that you need to be responsive to and attuned to. Um, But I think the hardest thing is probably, you know, like they say, admitting you have a problem. Um, A lot of people, a lot of companies uh, came out with wonderful statements um, over the summer, right, when George Floyd was murdered and there became this national conversation around race. Um, You had companies writing checks and making statements and all of it was very externally facing, right? It was, we condemn racist violence, we um, are writing this check to X, Y, Z, but not turning around and doing that internal work and saying, what's our role, right? What role are we playing in upholding white supremacy? 
that's a really hard question to get people to sit around a com- in a conference table and really grapple with. And so it's a lot easier to just say, we wrote a check to NAACP and like, we did the job, you know, we did the work. So I think it's, well, it's just having those conversations, admitting you have a problem. <laughs> well, and I, do you think, because I, what I've seen over the last at least 10 years is this need to prove ROI, you know, and if we're talking oh, about yes, companies yeah. and we're talking about corporations, I get it. That's a reality. Yet McKinsey and others uh, who are respectable researchers have come out with data that says, uh, for example, for every 10% increase in racial and ethnic diversity on your senior leadership team, you see a 0.8% rise in EBITDA, in earnings before mm-hmm. interest and taxes. And that companies in, in, the, in, in companies in comparable industries who have racially diverse uh, staffs Okay, my Siri is talking. Are you hearing this? I hope not. Oh no, no. <laughs> this is like the joy of the uh, the technology space. I've all of a sudden got Siri in my ear, thinking I'm talking to her. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. But what you also see is that um, companies that have about f- have that have racially diverse employee bases have a 35 percent better financial outputs, revenues, and so we know that there's a monetary connection. We know that there is uh, a population, and as you said, product. I was hearing one of the women from Wikipedia who talks a lot about that Wikipedia is largely written by European white males. Mm. And so how does that impact our understanding of the world when it's used globally as an information source? And she was also saying that earpods oh, yes, were designed. Was <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That, yes. that earpod, their earpods were basically designed by white men. And she, she asked the women in the room, she said, of the black women in the room, how many of you do the earpods not fit in your ear? And almost all of them raised their hand. They said that's because none of them were involved in designing them. Yeah. And physiologically, like we have genetic disposition of smaller ear cavities. And I was like, oh my gosh, this makes perfect sense. Yeah. So we have all that. So then what, what is stopping companies? What's the barrier? It's still at the end of the day, I think it's the level of discomfort. Um, and it's and it goes both ways, right? So let's say you are the one black woman on the product design team at Apple who, you know, you're invited to the room, right? And you might be there, but do you feel comfortable? Have they created a space where you feel comfortable being like, guys, <laughs> we haven't tested everyone. Um, so I think that's the... And then even getting there, right? That's a step. Then there's the uncomfortableness of having con- having you know inclusive interviews, um, getting to the point where people of color want to accept an offer and want to stay at your company um, and share their voice. So it's there's a lot of just uncomfortable uncomfortableness and comfortability um, that we have to work through. And I think that's why even when you know that this is going to be financially successful, this is going to hit your bottom line in a good way. Um, it's still hard to do that work. It's still hard for a lot of people. And then, you know, once they get past that and we can, you know, get into like tactics, um, it's work, right? You're not just going to wake up and decide, I want more black people at my company. And then like, hallelujah, they all start applying. You have to go out and find them. You have to court them. You have to um, make an employer brand that is welcoming. You've got to create an inclusive interview process, right? It goes the whole um employee life cycle, as we call it, in people operations. Well, and I, I, I found this quote, which was, comfort is the enemy of progress. And it was actually by P.T. Barnum, who Barnum and Bailey Circus, which I thought was fantastic, who was apparently a, a very big activist as well. So, awesome. but, but it's that idea of uncomfortableness that is so hard yeah. for so many of us. And look, the reality is a lot of what we're working with and against is been a, a predominantly white uh, executive team, a predominantly male executive team at companies. So how would you, and what would you recommend to, um, especially those white, uh, people who are the leaders on how to engage in this process specifically around race? Cause we've decided we've got to kind of separate gender, race, all, you know, sexual orientation, all of these different diversity metrics. Yeah, I think like any behavioral change, one of the most effective ways to actually affect that change is to 
set an intention and make it public, right? Hold yourself accountable. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to lose weight, you might tell your family, I'm not eating ice cream anymore and I'm going to cut 20 pounds or whatever it is. Um, and if you look at behavioral science, that's a good way to help people hold themselves accountable and actually hit that goal. So similarly in the workplace, I love when companies are able to look at where they are, set a stretch goal, just like you're setting, right? Like it's 2021. A lot of us were probably just in strategic planning for the year. We're setting goals around subscriber counts, around, you know, whatever matters to us in our company. We're setting these goals. Similarly, set goals around, we have 10 openings this year. We want to fill them with at least, um, you know, whatever city we're in representation, right? We want to fill them with three black people. We want to fill them with um, five people of color. We want to fill them with seven people of color, whatever it is, um, set that goal and share it with the company. Just hold yourself accountable. That's the first step. And then you've got that pressure that you've put on yourself to work backwards and to, um, and to solve it. Right. So then there's all, I mean, and it is work, right. Um, but you can kind of reverse engineer from there. So how do you avoid tokenism? Yeah. So when you tell a senior team, we're going to hire X number of women, or we're going to hire X number of people of color, and that you don't create a culture where, well, they're just hired because. Yeah. Well, and that's so tough um, because sometimes there is that sense where, uh, especially with current employees, um, for example, in, in the tech world, in the startup world, uh, there's a big premium on employee referrals and you will get referral bonuses a lot. Um, and this has come under a bit of scrutiny because when you see a company start and it's started by a white guy, because, you know, issues around who's getting funding for their startups and he hires his friends because he can't pay them, but they trust him and they trust his idea. And, you know, they were college buddies. So now it's four white guys and then, you know, they need to hire their fifth and fifth or 10th hires and they hire their friends. Right. So you can see, um, how that happens. And then you create these employee referral bonuses where you get incentivized to refer your friends. And a lot of times, because of our society, your friends look like you. Anyway, long story short, that people do get upset when their friends don't get hired and when a woman gets hired instead or a person of color gets hired instead. To my mind, I don't, I think it's more a boogeyman. I don't think there's any manager who's actually like, I'm just going to you know, blow this up because like blow my team up, blow my KPIs, blow my team's goals up just to hit this goal. And do you know what I mean? Like they're not just hiring a woman just to like check a box because at the end of the day, it's also their team and their team's performance. So it's more the perception. And so how can you get around that perception that this person wasn't just hired to fit a quota? Um, and that's about communications, right? That's your skill. That's where Marjorie comes in. So. The, the companies that you see that are already diving into this work, what are you seeing that's working and where are you, what are some of the pitfalls that you would caution companies against um, in doing specifically racial equity work? Yeah. So I think the companies that are doing it most effectively, they're focusing first on building an inclusive culture. So they're doing the work and they're looking at, okay, what are our policies? What are our, um, you know, what are the institutional barriers that are keeping us from bringing more people of color into the company? And so they start evaluating things like, do we really need a college degree to, for this role, right? A lot of companies have started to take away that requirement because they realize it's not actually necessary for their success in the role. And moreover, it's serves as a barrier to people of color in particular who, for various reasons, um, are less likely to complete college. The companies that are trying but not doing it well are the ones that are focusing on recruiting first. So they're saying, like, let's just recruit as many, you know, let's show up at all the historically Black colleges and, like, get give everyone exciting material and recruit them and not really thinking about, okay, now that we've gotten them in the door, how are we going to engage them? Okay, that's a really important point you just made, because I think a lot of companies, they start with the diversity goal, we're going to get everybody in the door, yeah, 
And then they realize that diversity and inclusion are two very different things. So real quick, define the difference between diversity and inclusion for us. Yeah. So diversity is really just your numbers, your demographic data, your representation, what percent of the company is black, Asian, Hispanic, white, what percent men and women. Um, Inclusion is deeper. It's do these people, once they're here, do they feel included? Do people feel like they can speak up, um, that they can report bad behavior, that their ideas are valued? Um, So that's really inclusion. I heard this great, um, you know, a lot of people have probably heard it. Um, this kind of analogy that diversity is being invited to the dance and inclusion is being asked to dance, right? So you're not just standing on the wall, you know, twiddling your thumbs. Um, and then equity, which is the next buzzword that's been introduced in the past few years, is actually being asked to pick some of the playlist. So I think that's a good way to think through, you know, we might be inviting people into our company, but are we letting them choose the playlist sometimes? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's where when you talk about even how do you uh, how do you scan your environment to know what barriers are? And I think the challenge is if you are not a person of color, if you are not a female, it's hard without lived experience to know what a lot of those things are. And it doesn't make it wrong that you don't just inherently know, but it's where having that at a leadership level or consulting level or whatever level you need to start at, someone who's got those eyes and that experience to know, okay, that's where there's a barrier, right? Yeah. Well, and not just to, you know, plug Notly Tide, um, because we do <laughs> consulting. <laughs> for Feel free. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's really important to use outside help. So often companies will lean on the few people of color that they already have, or the few women that they already have. And those people might be passionate about the work as well, right? They want to help build the culture. They have obvious um, personal investment in building a more inclusive culture, but they also have full-time jobs and they're held to different standards. And so many people have been burned out by being asked to be on their, you know, company's new diversity and inclusion committee and not getting compensated or recognized for that. Um, And because of that, I, I do think companies just need to bring in external help a lot of the times. Yeah. And I think also in that space, you know, having worked as a consultant myself, people will share things with you that they won't feel safe necessarily yeah. saying internally. For sure. And they yeah. kind of need that space, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of good reasons um, to bring in a third party. And even if it's just, uh, there's also third party tools out there. Um, mm-hmm. A friend of mine started, it. it's kind of like a virtual ombudsman um, where you can, it, it is that, th- it's like an anonymous third party where you can say like, hey, this happened. I think it's kind of weird and get a little bit of support. Um, So so there's tools, you know, you can find something that will fit your budget. If you care about this, you'll make the budget. Um, There's also, there's been conversations about like, you know, especially pre-COVID times, there were a lot of startups that had a bigger alcohol and party budget than they had a DEI budget. Mm -hmm. Well, and how would you recommend, because again, one of the things I see as a pitfall of companies is DEI is more of a PR activity than it is an actual function. It's, you know, make us look great about diversity, but at the same time, that looks really expensive or really hard to tackle. So we're just going to, you know, skirt around it. Um, You know, things like training, things like a lot, you know, some of these brass tacks we're seeing mixed results on, right? Yeah. Um, in fact, even on training, you know, when you have people, I'm seeing companies that have been have bringing in facil are using, sorry, their own employees as facilitators on conversations around race and gender, and without, frankly, training on how to manage a room and how to have that conversation in a productive way, I've seen it be more damaging than helpful. Yeah. So, how would you recommend companies? you know, what awareness should they have again about entering the space? Because we don't want to scare them off, but at the same time, feel yeah. safe putting their toes in the water. Yeah. I think um, that goes back to like, you can't just ask your employees to do things just because they represent, you know, an underrepresented group um, because they don't, right. They represent themselves and they might say something off the wall. They haven't um, built a career or profession out of this type of work. Um, so I think, that my advice is just find find the budget. There are so many, even here in Austin, there's so many great consultants. Um, There are people who can come in and just do like 
even like one hour, like quick deep dive, um, start like do the work and, and try. I also had a friend um, who's head of HR at a company here and she brought in consultants and it just did not vibe right um, with their company culture for whatever reason. Don't give up. Um, probably set expectations at the outset that this will be uncomfortable work. We will fail just like anything else we do. Not 100% of our products instantly achieve product market fit. Not 100% of our marketing efforts instantly, you know, hit the goals we set for them. We don't give up, right? Um, so I think setting those expectations as well, that there will be misses in this work, just like in any other work that a company um, is committed to doing. Well, and I have to plug uh, Courageous Conversations, which yeah. the LBJ Library helps facilitate with Leadership Austin, because I think as a starting point, it's at least for the leadership getting to a place where they can understand and feel comfortable having the conversation about race. Because yeah. I think setting that intention and just the sheer nervousness I see people carry into the room tells them, tells everybody around them how they feel about it. And, um, and I think that, you know, also making it clear kind of like we did at the beginning, you know, we're going to say stuff, you can say it however you need to say it and know that the intent is good, but that we can all also be in a place where we're willing to say, you know, that didn't feel good to me the way you said that. And let me help you understand why and accept that feedback in a way that allows us to do it differently. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen this in rooms, for example, where people say, well, I kind of see myself as colorblind, so this isn't really a thing for me. This is super common, right? And, you know, Kelly, what does that feel like to you when someone says that? It's uh, it's invalidating, right? It's it's offensive. It's like, I'm Black. I've, I've lived my life as a Black person. Um, I'm actually biracial, <laughs> but I live my life as a Black person. Um, and I think that when people say they don't see race, it's saying, the things that are my lived experience, right? Um, a quick little anecdote. I was at a farmer's market once with two white friends and we were like waiting to get like a sample of something. And the person there just would not look at me, would not give me a sample. And not, neither of my two friends did not notice it. And I, afterwards I was like, guys, that was so weird. And they were like, no way that didn't happen. I'm like, that literally just happened. Um, so anyway, obviously I'm getting emotional and passionate about it. But yeah, when people say they're colorblind, it's like, it's not, it's not real. Um, people of color don't have the ability to uh, pretend that color doesn't exist. And why do you think white people say that? It's a, it's a goal, right? It's ideal. Yeah. That would be a wonderful world, um, right? That's, you know, MLK's I have a dream, right? Like, it's just, not, we're not there yet. Um, but it's also, think, it's also saying that there is a value attribu attributed to certain colors, right? Oh, yes. So yeah. it, right? It's because we could say like red hair or black hair or brown hair and colorblind would mean they're all equally wonderful. But to say, I'm, you know, no, no, I don't see any of it is, is kind of removing the value or, or saying that yeah. there's a rank and file, right? That's a really And I good think point. so these kinds of conversations are what people are afraid of having in a workplace and that's where I think, especially with light, white leadership, to sort of own that, hey, I'm uncomfortable and I just, I really want to do this well. And so, you know, help me, help me understand if there are things I say that don't feel right or help me um, recognize the things that are my blind spots, you know? And, yeah. and, and by the way, this is like a journey we're on lifelong because, you know, we've all been raised in the environments we've been raised in. And it doesn't make us bad or good to come from where we come from. It's all about trying to be better. Yeah. And going back to courageous conversations, um, you know, you said, help me. And I'm like, I think there's also help yourself, right? Um, one of the things we do at Notley is we cover all of our employees. If they want to take courageous conversations, uh, we cover the cost. Um, and I think Leadership Austin also has scholarships mm -hmm. that people need to. Um, but it's just like, make that time, go through that training. It's really powerful. Um, or, or whatever you can do to educate yourself, take, do it, right? Like take that step. Um, and I think that's going to, it's a signal and it's also an action. 
That's awesome. Um, yes, Notley's doing great work. I can I can also help endorse that because they're they're a great go to. So I want to um, I want to dive into some questions, and so I want to encourage anyone who wants to send questions, and and we will try to get to everything we can. Um, and so I'm going to just dive on in. Um, okay, so we got another question about how do you balance a desire to be diverse with a desire to hire well qualified individuals? So. What do you talk, talk about the Rooney rule? Do you, do, does, do, if, in case people don't understand, yeah. that was when the NFL sort of was seeking to hire some black coaches and they basically committed that they would have, was at least one or two resumes of black coaches? I can't remember exactly. Uh, they would at least interview one coach of color. Right. And that did actually move the needle. They started, they did hire. And then it went back and it, uh, oh, it's not been effective. Yeah. Okay. Um, because what happened is it became tokenism. So, and because these, a lot of these interviews are public, anyway, I won't get into the NFL, okay. <laughs> uh, but people were like, why did you interview this person? And they're clearly not qualified. You're just, you're literally checking a box. Um, and, and that can happen with the Rooney rule. Uh, I kind of, I went at that question because it, that question, and, and that's one of those questions that I'm glad the person asked it. And it's important to ask these questions, but as a very qualified person of color and woman, I'm like, why the kind of the uh, assumption in that question is that the two are mutually exclusive, right? Mm -hmm. Or that there's some like, you know, gulf that you have to cross um, to get right. top talent versus talent of color. Um, really, it's about companies doing the work. Top talent is out there. They're just not at companies that aren't embracing them. Um, you'll see some companies, it's really funny. And uh, particularly of women in engineering, like at, like at FabFitFun, which is a company I led people operations for several years ago, we had like 80% women on our engineering team. And we joked, we're like stealing all of the female engineering talent in LA because once they saw a few of us, they all wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And so we had our pick of the litter. We had, we could choose the most top talent um, out there because we got so many resumes. So many people wanted to be part of that culture. And so I think if you create a culture where people want to be at and where they know that they can thrive and um, be successful, you are going to be getting all the black people who went to Harvard, Stanford, Yale, whatever, like whatever barometer of talent you want to say, um, they'll be applying. And if you don't, you're not going to get that, right? So I think um, there's not that gulf between top talent and person of color. It's, is your company a place where talented people of color, of which there are many, want yeah. to work. So a lot, I mean, a lot of that's a communications function, right? Of communicating yeah. those values throughout the company so that there isn't that question of, well, then why is this person here, right? Yeah. So then on, on that front, what would you, what advice would you have for an early, very early stage company in this case, looking specifically to hire diverse leaders for key roles, including co-founders even? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things, and again, it's like, you've got to put your money where your mouth is. There are a lot of great recruiters out there. Um, I just connected with an organization called Culture Shift, and they've got a database of amazing talent, Black talent in particular, um, at the senior and executive levels. And But you're going to have to pay, right? Like They've spent time building those networks and that relationship um, that, you know, if you're really committed to it, then you hire a headhunter and the headhunter will find that like those people are out there. Um, you've got to put in the time or, and, or the money to find them. Um, and startups can do that. I think for startups, if you can't hire a headhunter, um, get out there, right? Like there's DivInc here in Austin where there's amazing talent, um, people who might be interested and very well qualified to become a co-founder, um, you know, get on different Reddit boards or Facebook groups or, you know, wherever, like put yourself out there. Um, there's email lists. There's a wealth of opportunities to access talent if you're looking for it. If you're just like, I opened my Rolodex and my LinkedIn page and there's no one black to hire, like, I guess I'm going to give up and you're not going to find talent. Because we, because we naturally gravitate towards people like us in different ways, right? And yeah. so that's a normal thing. I think there's sort of this feeling of like, oh, is that bad? But, you know, you and I connect on a lot of different things we have in common. And, but, you know, we also are gravitate towards people like us and from our yeah, schools. So when you witness racism or misogyny in a company, how do you point it out 
when you have not said anything before? You say something. <laughs> um, you don't, I think a lot of people are, they think they have to have an identity as, you know, um, I'm someone who says something like I'm the rabble rouser. Or I'm the person who stirs the pot. A lot of times in companies you'll have, um, you know, I'll go into companies and they'll say, oh, so-and-so is the one who like, will give that message to HR. And I'm like, why won't you give that message to HR? Like, why is it so-and-so's job? Uh, and it's because so-and-so has always done it. Right. And so I think when you're in that place of fear of like, I'm not the one who usually speaks up, I want to speak up, but that's not who I am. Um, that's the moment to really step into that uncomfortable feeling and, and become that person. Right. Um, everyone had the first time they said something against racism or misogyny. Maybe it was in second grade. Maybe it was when they were 42 years old. Um, but everyone's got like, you have to have your first time of being an actual ally and an actual um, advocate. Well, an allyship is shown to have the most impact on things like sexual harassment as well. Yeah. And so it's, it's so much more powerful to have someone speak up for you than it is to have to make that complaint yourself. So, yeah. Um, another one of my friends, actually, I'll share this. Um, she, she had someone, um, offend her for some reason, right? I can't even remember what it was, but her and co other colleagues heard it. Um, and she later, she goes back to her desk and a few other colleagues who were there were like, that was so messed up. I'm so sorry that happened to you. And she was even more upset with them because she was like, why didn't you say that in public to this person while it was happening? Why did you let this happen to me? And so I get that there's a lot of people who think they're being allies by like, going and comforting someone after something that has happened. But really, if you can have that confidence, someone put confidence in the chat. Um, if you can have that confidence to say it in the moment, it's so much more powerful. So what would you recommend for um, government agencies or nonprofits or people that just do not have the budgets to say hire an outside consultant? What would you recommend they do to optimize this work within? Yeah. So that's just going to take more time. Um, you become your own recruiter, right? Uh, look at, you know, top of mind to me was there's LinkedIn groups. We've got a group here. I think it's like young nonprofit professionals or something. Go in that LinkedIn group and stalk, right? Look, okay, here's women who have the experience I'm looking for. Here's people of color who have the experience I'm looking for. Um, direct message them, right? Like reach out and say, hey, we're trying to be intentional about building a more diverse um, company. We've got this role open and it looks like from your profile, you'd be, you'd excel in this role. Um, we'd love to have you apply. Right. That's a way to be honest and not like hide the ball. Like I don't want them to know, like you can be honest and say, we're trying to build a more diverse culture um, and just hit them up. Like people have definitely hit me up on LinkedIn uh, with, with things like that. And it's, it's welcome. Yeah. And then how would you recommend uh, companies that have DNI task force, and I actually hear this a lot. It's that how do you keep the momentum going? Because yeah. people get frustrated, and this is hard work, and it takes time. So, what would you recommend organizations do to kind of keep that energy going? I think again, it's it's back to anything else that we're doing when we're setting a goal um, as a company. You break it down into quarterly goals. You have um, you know maybe weekly meetings where you're holding yourself accountable. Um, it, we, we just set some goals for 2021 at Notley. We've then set it down. What are we going to do this quarter? What are OKRs around that? Our objectives and key results. And then each week, we publicly say, where have we gotten with that? And actually, each day when our, with our stand-up on Slack, we say what we're going to do to hit that goal. And so I think that's the way you, you can capture small wins. You can stay on top of, you know, if, if something's getting into like the orange, right? And it's not likely to be... Uh, achieved in the time frame that you set, you can be aware of it rather than saying, you know, at the beginning of the year, our diversity tax force is going to increase our um, recruitment of black professionals by 50%. And then like you have a black history month lunch and learn, and then like December rolls around and you didn't do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's, yeah. but to your point, it's celebrating the benchmarks and setting reasonable yeah. benchmarks so that you can actually get there versus it feeling you know, overwhelming. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, again, that's like with any OKR, right? You're not going to say like, we're launching this new feature and we're going to get like a hundred net promoter score within the first month. Right. right. Um, 
whatever goal you're setting, you're going to be, you're going to have a stretch goal, but you're going to be reasonable about it. Okay. I got one that said, I've tried to have conversations on race at work, but have been told not to bring politics into work. Mm. I'm struggling with how to deal with this. Mm. It's tough. Uh, because, and I will try to not get political, uh, the last administration that was very much, you know, intertwined, right? Um, we had some, I forget who it was here, but like someone who was in, involved with our state elections who said wearing a Black Lives Matter shirt to a voting location is electioneering. Yeah, it was. And in in like, the cycle, it was told you were not, you were not yeah. allowed to, yeah. And it's like, since when does a statement about race and racial justice turn into a Democrat, Republican mm-hmm. electioneering for a certain candidate or another statement, right? You can wear, you know, save the rainforest uh, and no one's going to say you're electioneering, I don't mm-hmm. think. Um, so it is tough. I think it can, you know, depending on the conversation, it can veer into, you know, Trump and the coup and the Confederate flags and right, like, and it can kind of devolve into that. I think as best as you can have a goal when you're entering those conversations, what's your goal when you're coming to the workplace and you're going to talk about race? Are you trying to um, create more inclusivity? Are you trying to um, call things out? Like if you see racial microaggressions, what's your goal in having this conversation and be transparent about that goal. So when the conversation starts to veer into whatever's going on in the news, um, you can bring it back and you can say like, hey, like we're not talking about why they were holding Confederate flags, right? We're talking about how we can attract more black talent to our company. Yeah, I, I, and I think even starting with a question about, help me understand what feels political about valuing <laughs> racial diversity in the company. And, yeah. and kind of going through that curious process. And as you said, sort of framing it as, well, let's think about this in terms of values of the company. And then what we're trying to accomplish as an organization. And yeah. what does that mean for our hiring? What does it mean for our product? What does it mean for our innovation? Because we know diverse companies are almost two times more innovative than uh, non-diverse ethnically and racially diverse companies. So um, getting good ones then. Okay, so our company is currently putting all leaders and board members through beyond diversity training. What is important to do internally in our company oh, after we've exposed them to this conversation and the work? So just for those on the call who haven't attended, it, as a training, it's really more of an experience and an awareness uh, activity. It, it is, I mean, it's absolutely wonderful. It's transformative. And a lot of it is about learning how to own and understand our own race story in the context of others and how to enter those conversations so Kelly, what would you recommend people do uh, coming out of that? Yeah, I mean, first off, commend them for having their executives go through that program. Um, you know, it is two days like that. That's a commitment. That's a lot, um, yeah. So it's really great that they're doing that. Next step, just like I advise for companies that aren't going through that, set goals. You've got to hold yourself publicly accountable. Um, otherwise, it's just too easy for it to slip through the cracks. Um, so I would say they come back. Let's have a check-in one week later to say, what are our goals? Like knowing what we know now, where can we improve our company? Um, What goals do we want to see in 2021? Who's going to own what? Um, And get into the tactics. Mm -hmm. And I think also even creating a space for people who've been through it to have a conversation coming out of it. Because there's a lot of processing, right? And being able to process in that way creates... I think an appropriate intimacy or understanding or shared understanding and a shared language even, because I think that's the other hard thing is we all come into this with very different levels of comfortability and also different language about how we talk about things. And to your point, am I allowed to say black or is it African-American or which thing am I supposed to say? And then people just go that person because I don't know what to do. (laughs) Uh, So it creates this panic and there's gotta be like some levity, right? There's gotta be permission to kind of get it wrong and, and have that again, shared, shared goal and understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a question about the gaps in educational attainment tied to socioeconomic status and race. Can you talk about the responsibilities you see for corporations and businesses to provide early experiences for young people of color? Um, 
and who are still in the education process and maybe who their parents are not yeah. professional workers. You know, this is something I get fired up about. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll let, I mean, you can answer. No, no, go. Well. <laughs> I, I've, got, I've got thoughts. Um, I think that is one of the best ways to recruit diverse talent. And it's not just the long game. When you engage with a company, as an organization like Code to College, for example, here in Austin, you're engaging with high school students from underrepresented backgrounds. They're not realistically going to get a job and be a full-time employee for another five, six years. Um, But what it signals to the rest of the community is that you're a company that cares. And so now me as a person of color, I see you're involved. I'm, you know, mid senior level in my career. I want to get involved with your company. I want to learn more about what you're doing. So I think that's actually, um, it's, it's like selfish almost, right? It's like, we can do something good and then also benefit. Like we're not just giving, um, to these organizations that are helping, uh, underrepresented students get into college or get through college, but we're also building our employer brand so that we can attract the top talent so that the top talent can be begging us for a job, right? Like sending their resumes, sending their friends to us. Um, so, so I think it's, you know, it's a really smart tactic. But I'd also challenge companies to think about how in their recruiting process, they look at resumes Oh yeah. because there are tons of first generation college students, which are disproportionately people of color who are working three jobs while putting themselves through school and, you know, volunteering at a nonprofit on the side and who would be an incredible employee, but don't maybe have the, you know, I had the Deloitte, you know, uh, internship for three years before then coming in. And I think that reimagining and thinking about how you look at pipeline matters. Yeah. Go, Kelly. And Marjorie, I'm like, so, uh, <laughs> at, at, uh, you pen there. Um, or an undergrad, they asked employers who were coming to recruit if they would like to uh, select a few resumes, right? Instead of going through 600 undergrad resumes, go through these 20, tell us which ones you like and which ones you don't like, and we will curate the best 50 resumes for you, right? So that's the setup. And they, but they aren't real resumes, in fact. They are fake resumes. They've got, uh, gendered names, so traditionally male or female names, and they've got racialized names. So names like Jamal versus John, right? Where you're not sure, right? You don't have a picture necessarily, but you can imply that this is a black person. Maybe this is a white person. (sighs) Even with that, the, and even with companies saying we are looking to hire more diverse talent, there was by, and this was like two years ago, there was bias. They did not want Jamal, even when Jamal had a higher GPA, they did not want the woman even, they were, they ranked the woman less, even when she had a higher GPA. Um, I'd I'll like find it and share, like share. Oh yeah. No. And this is great for companies that have not done this. There is the implicit association test that was run out of Harvard, uh, Marzi Banaji, and she does a ton of work with the larger uh, consultancies, but it's under this idea of, we all come with implicit bias. Yeah. And again, this is part of that journey you go through in courageous conversations, but this acceptance and understanding that that doesn't make us evil, it makes us human. And whether it's about the gap in someone's teeth or the shape of their nose or you know all different kinds of things that play into our bias, it does impact the way we look at a resume or how we you know yeah. give salaries. And, and by the way, like this is even just on the gender stand, stand front you see women giving other women lower salaries than give men when they're in that same blind selection process where they only see, you know, the name. And so um, that just makes us human. And so overcoming that by being aware and then saying, oh, I know I've got this. So I need to look more closely at how I think about this hiring or I think about the salary. I think about this promotion is what matters. Um, I've had another question come in about uh, companies that are wanting to move more people of color into leadership, but see little attrition of their white leadership. Mm. And so there just aren't the the spots at a, at a given moment. What would you recommend they do? That's tough and that's real. Um, but I think they also need to put in the work now and build those um, networks. A company like that, um, that's worried about like, you know, uh, persistence in the leadership ranks, they're probably more established. They've got the financial resources to um, 
to go out late, like engage with headhunters um, or recruiters and start building those relationships, kind of build that funnel of people so that when, you know, the CMO decides to retire, the CTO finally does decide to retire, go to a different company, you instantly have a relationship and you can plug someone in. That's the work, the like, you know, follow them on LinkedIn and like, you know, what they're posting, um, send them an article. Like I, I saw this article and thought of you, right? You are courting them so that when the time does come, you can fill them and you're not, you know, stuck at a loss because your CTO just gave you, you know, four weeks notice and now you need to replace, you need to backfill them. Um, so that would be my advice for companies in that position, which is common. Well, and also to think about things like board positions, you know, there's different kinds of leadership at companies beyond just, you know, your, your senior team or even, you know, springing in senior advisors or to your point, like, how do you create the pipeline? So what, who, who are your number twos that then yeah. move into those legacy positions? Um, so another question, how can we as a society begin to put private companies, public agencies and nonprofits on notice to be transparent about the pay and promotion inequities between genders and begin to close the economic gaps that persist. And I would say this is about race too, because we know that black women and Latino women, Latina women get paid less than white women who get paid less than white men. Yeah. Um, I think Marjorie and I might've giggled <laughs> because we're working on something uh, to help with that. Um, I think there is space for a platform that does um, provide that transparency and that honesty um, and public accountability. And I think it really doesn't exist right now, but a lot of times that public pressure is what's actually going to move the needle. Um, and so, you know, maybe in a year we'll, we'll fill you in. <laughs> yeah, that's right. T T TBD. But, you know, but there is an underreporting. you know, there is not a lot of transparency. And yeah. part of that reason is that companies are, Again, there's that accountability piece you said, which is why I think if, even if a company can say, we're going to hold ourselves accountable with our internal teams by saying we're going to commit to this, it doesn't mean you have to you know, put it on the cover of the New York Times, but we'd be thrilled if you wanted to, uh, but just to hold yourselves accountable for that movement. Yeah. Um, so I had an interesting question come in. So this is from a Black man who is in a predominantly white industry, specifically oil and gas. And he's responsible for hiring, and his strategy has always been to hire the most qualified person, regardless of race, gender, or sexual orientation. And opening up that process to include more diverse candidates is difficult in oil and gas. So how would you seek to improve diversity under these circumstances? Yeah, well, I would do um, the same thing that we recommended earlier with working uh, at the high school and college level. Um, there must be majors that, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the oil and gas industry, to be honest. Um, but there must be majors, right? I know bio, chemical engineering um, that you are looking at. And from there, there must be student groups, right? You've got NSBE, National Society of Black Engineers. Are you engaging with NSBE? Are you sponsoring their, their events? Um, are you sponsoring scholarships for them? Are you putting your name out there so that when people do scroll through LinkedIn and they see your company, they're not just going to keep scrolling. They're going to say, oh, I saw them at Nesby. Oh, I talked to one of their recruiters at the last um, conference I was at. Uh, you've got that kind of name brand with those organizations um, that already exist. And so it might take money, you know, sponsorships or scholarships, but it's going to um, help you reach those, those candidates. There's also, you know, um, a lot of people want to say, well, you know, I'll use round numbers. You know, let's say UT graduates 100 computer science uh, grads a year, and only 20 of them are women. So they're like, how can we ever have more than 20% of our company be, 20% of our engineering team be women uh, if, if these are the numbers, right? This is the pool. And I'm like, well, why can't you have all 20 of them, right? Like, why not, right? That's what we did at FabFitFun. We had half of the women engineers in LA probably know, um, worked for us, right? And so there's other companies that are struggling, but why can't your company have all of the black talent in the oil and gas industry? There might, there might be less talent there because whatever reason they didn't go into that industry, but they exist, they're there. There's nothing saying that your company can't capture them, excite them and engage them and promote them. Yeah. Here's the other thing I just wanted to flag. We've been, I've been getting a lot of questions about who to work with in town on DEI consulting um, and also on the recruiting front. 
So maybe we could think of a way to get a resource to our attendees. You're going to get a three point, sorry, Kelly's two, Kelly's three recommendations for organizations to look at um, and be thinking about when you're doing this work. Um, Kelly, is there any one place you could say to go to kind of know who who's doing this in town? There's not one place. Um, there's like some, uh, you know, just unofficial groups of DEI consultants that get together and, you know, trade notes. Um, but I can't, I'd be happy to share in, I think we will send like an email out after. Okay. Um, so we'll send some resources. Some resources, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sorry for the questions we did not get to. Already, Kelly and I will have to do like an after hours, like we're here all night yeah. answering questions and talking about this issue. But I, I will say we're very grateful for everyone who has taken the time um, and your being here is a really important first step is, is just really entering the conversation, participating in it. Anything either of us can do to support any of you, feel free to reach out to LBJ or to us directly. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being here tonight and participating in this whole series with LBJ. It's a really awesome thing that's happening. Kelly, thank you. Of course, thank you.